are you prepared for deflation? That's right. I said deflation. We have to remember, we live in a world of probabilities, not certainties. And although my base case is that we go through long-term stagflation, it doesn't mean that in the interim, we can't have bouts of deflation where prices, especially asset prices, come crashing down. And like I said, although it's not my base case, I think there is a very strong argument for deflation. I'm going to reveal that to you right now in three simple, fast steps. Step number one, let's go over the wealth effect, or in this case, the reverse <laughs> wealth effect. To understand this concept, editor, cut to the clip from Investopedia. The wealth effect is a psychological phenomenon that causes people to spend more as the value of their assets rises. The premise is that when consumers' homes or investment portfolios increase in value, they feel more financially secure, so they increase their spending. Conversely, when consumers see the value of their homes or portfolios fall, they tend to spend less. The wealth effect attempts to explain why consumers might change their spending habits even if their income and fixed costs have stayed the same. Here is an example of how the wealth effect works. Kiki purchased a house for $300,000 in 2007. She earned a $100,000 salary and her average expenses, including housing, were $75,000 per year. In 2008, the Great Recession lowered her home's value to $260,000. Kiki's income was still $100,000 and her expenses were still $75,000. But she cut back on her variable expenses because she was concerned about the drop in her home equity. She started spending $60,000 a year instead of $75,000. In 2013, when her home's value rebounded and grew to $320,000, Kiki felt more secure as her home equity increased. While her income was still $100,000 adjusted for inflation, she increased her spending to $85,000 because of her newfound sense of wealth. So right off the bat, I think the example used with Kiki, <laughs> or whatever her name was, isn't that great. It describes what most economists consider the wealth effect, so that's good. But I don't think their definition or their view, their concept of how this works is accurate at all. I think it's very incomplete, to say the least. First and foremost, they gave the example of her house going down during the GFC to 260000 from three hundred. Yeah, guess again. <laughs> Try going down from 300 down to about 160 if you remember the GFC and prices going down from 2006 all the way to 2012. Another thing that I think made it a little less than accurate was they only really referenced the psychological impact of the spending that Kiki was doing. Her income stayed the same. Okay, fine. But then they said the main component of the wealth effect is, is Kiki spending less or is she spending more? If she's spending less, then this could have a negative impact on the economy, the reverse wealth effect. And if she is spending more, then this has a positive impact on the economy. Typical mainstream Keynesian economics, where they only focus on the demand side of the equation. But like I said, my biggest problem with the video is how incomplete it was when you think about the impact asset prices like housing and the stock market have on the overall economy. To illustrate my point, let's go over what I think is a little bit better example. So instead of Kiki, we've got everyone's favorite, Moody the Millennial. And Moody wants to buy a house because they think that prices always go up. Prices have been going up since 2012, and we know that this is a really smart investment. So Moody creates demand. Okay, well, let's just pretend for a moment that the house hasn't been built. So insert Builder Bob. He comes in with all of his workers to build this house because he sees that demand is outstripping supply. So he sees a profit opportunity. So after the house is built, Moody comes in and wants to buy it. Now, unfortunately, they 
don't have enough to pay for it in cash. So they have to go to the mortgage broker. Well, this is Mortgage Mike. So he comes in, gives the mortgage to Moody. So they can go ahead and buy the house, let's say directly from Builder Bob. So Mortgage Mike is making money off of this transaction. Moody pays Bob the Builder. He makes a profit. He pays his employees and they make money. Their purchasing power increases. That's not all because Mortgage Mike is really just the originator of the loan. Who's creating the additional money supply is the bank. So then the bank is also making money on the transaction and therefore their share price most likely goes up. They're doing more business. So their shareholders also have more purchasing power. But that's not where the story ends because the bank doesn't keep that loan on their balance sheet. Oh, no, no, no. They sell it to Fannie and Freddie. They turn it into a mortgage-backed sausage, what I call it, mortgage-backed security, by the way. <laughs> that goes to a pension fund. The pension fund then makes a return on that because Moody is making their payments every single month, basically, to the pension fund. And they use that profit or that return on their investment to pay the pensioners who use that to go into the economy and buy more goods and services. So just because the price of housing has gone up, which prompted Moody to go out there and buy all of these individuals involved, Mortgage Mike, Builder Bob, the workers, the pension fund, the pension fund pensioners, <laughs> the bank, the shareholders, all of them have additional purchasing power to go in the economy and buy goods and services. And one thing the Keynesians do get right is one man's spending is another man's income. So again, buy these home prices or stock prices going up and up and up and up, it creates more economic activity. So if home prices or stock prices or crypto prices are coming down, 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 because the Fed is trying to create the reverse wealth effect to increase unemployment, why? To bring down CPI, we could have a dramatic decrease. They could overshoot. Remember, they overshot inflation. So why on earth couldn't they overshoot deflation or overshoot the reverse wealth effect because they don't understand it well enough? And that video from Investopedia perfectly illustrates how their view of this reverse wealth effect is incomplete. Therefore, there's a significant probability that by trying to create the reverse wealth effect, again, they overshoot. So inflation doesn't go from 8.6% down to 2%. It goes from 8.6% potentially down to negative 2% or negative 3%, which is consistent with the inflation that we saw in the 1940s. In 1947, inflation got all the way up to 19.5%. Two to three years later, it was all the way down to negative three. In other words, we went from 19.5% inflation to 3% deflation. Step number two, oh, but wait, there is more. Unfortunately, our deflation argument doesn't end with what we went over in step number one. Let's go back a little bit in time. So we discussed Moody buying a house, let's just say in Phoenix, and all of the economic activity that happened because home prices were going up and up and up. And then we discussed about how the economic activity would decline if home prices start to go down because all of this that you're seeing here would not have happened in the first place. If we go back to the GFC, most of you remember that all of that economic activity decreased. It contracted massively. And I would argue back then our economy wasn't near as dependent on asset prices as it is today. So let's think through what probably happened with Moody prior to them. And for those of you who are new to the channel, <laughs> I say this because I don't know Moody's preferred pronouns. And any good millennial out there will demand that you know 
their preferred pronouns. So anyway, Moody starts off back here in, of course, California. And Moody is a school teacher. <laughs> of course they are, because you definitely want Moody teaching your kids all of the things that they were spoon-fed and brainwashed by when they got their degree in liberal arts. <laughs> but, but anyway, I'm going off on a tangent here. So Moody in 2012, making 50 grand a year, they buy a house in California, say in the Bay Area somewhere. That seems fitting for Moody. And they buy a house for, let's say, 300000 something like that. But in 2021, the value or the price of the house has gone from 300000 up to $1.3 million. So Moody sells the house, nets a million dollars, and then buys this house in Phoenix that we went over in example number one. But they only use about $100,000 for a down payment to buy this new house. So they have a net gain of $900,000 of additional purchasing power. But let's remember that Moody is still a school teacher making $50,000 a year. So how has she or they received <laughs> this additional purchasing power? It's by asset prices going up and the banks contributing to that by lending more and more and more money, creating more currency units to buy homes that are going up and up and up in value. So now let's assume Moody takes the additional 900 in purchasing power and uses 400,000 to spend and 500,000 to invest. So they go on Instagram and they see all of their friends buying sprinter vans and traveling across the country in pure luxury and bliss, taking all of these photos and selfies of themselves, standing on the edge of the Grand Canyon or going to Niagara Falls and just living out of their $150,000 sprinter van. And they say to themselves, that is the life that I want. So, this $400,000 goes into this lifestyle and buying a sprinter van, <laughs> let's say. So there's $500,000 left that they wisely want to invest. So of course, they go to Mr. Ross Gerber. He is the man in California, especially in Silicon Valley. He takes all the money from all the Google workers and the Apple workers. And he says, I will invest this prudently for you. They say, Ross, what are you going to invest in? He says, oh, um, whatever it is that you like. That's what I'm going to invest in. Well, what about a return? Oh, uh, yeah, I don't care about that. Because all I care about is assets under management. So we've got this sign here, Ross saying, I love assets under management. But maybe what that sign could say is, I love whatever it is you want me to love. I think Ross could have had a very successful career as a politician. But getting back to the story here. So Ross takes the 500000 he got from Moody and he gives it to Startup Steve, who has just created a business model for something revolutionary. It's going to change the world. It's a new dog walking app. And because of this $500,000 investment, Startup Steve's dog walking app is now valued at $150 billion. So Steve takes some of those chips off the table and he goes in, spends that, and of course his workers and everything here that we discussed in this example number one with housing would increase the purchasing power of everyone involved in this ecosystem as well. So it becomes very clear how if asset prices go down significantly for a sustained period of time, all of these dollars going into the real economy would simply disappear. So you've got this dollar gone, gone. Well, it's gonna take a long time, so editor, maybe help me out with that. But all of these dollars disappear. Therefore, economic activity plummets. And we can see a good example of this right now with the crypto space. You guys have been reading the news, I'm sure where Terra Luna crashes, Celsius crashes, 
and all these other hedge funds and crypto platforms are either going out of business or suspending trading, suspending redemptions of your cryptocurrency that they have. Why? Because they are paying out these massive interest rates, 10%, 15%, even 20%. Well, how are they making those returns? Because they were lending them those cryptocurrencies that you own to other financial entities that would take them and be happy to pay the 20% or 25% because they thought crypto would always go up and up and up. But what happens if crypto goes down, then the whole house of cards comes crashing down with it. So my point is the economy that we have built in the United States is very similar to that crypto ecosystem that has absolutely collapsed in a deflationary death spiral. So the main takeaway from step number one and number two is we have the Federal Reserve here that we know is trying to create the reverse wealth effect. But in my opinion, they don't understand the degree to which that wealth effect impacts the United States. So they've got all their nifty models and formulas that say that if they bring down asset prices by 30%, and I'm just using the, these numbers as an example, that unemployment will increase, let's say to 6%, CPI goes down to 3%. But what if they overshoot? Because again, they don't understand how powerful the wealth effect is for the US economy. So asset prices actually come down by 40%, because of raising interest rates, quantitative tightening, whatever it is they're doing to bring them down in the first place. Then unemployment, let's say, goes up to 15%, bringing the overall CPI, as measured by the government, down to negative 1%, meaning deflation. Step number three, Jerome Powell has a decision to make, and it's all about legacy. Does he want to be remembered as Arthur Burns or Paul Volcker. Most of you probably don't even know who Arthur Burns was. And to a certain extent, that's my point. <laughs> but Arthur Burns was the Fed chair during the 1970s. And he is very well known for saying that inflation was transitory. He changed the CPI, he omitted things, and he kept claiming that there were these certain reasons we were going to have inflation, but eventually the CPI was gonna come back down until 1975, where he had to admit that it was true, inflation was here to stay. You contrast that to Paul Volcker coming in and having the guts, the balls to break the back of inflation. This is how history remembers these to gentlemen. And I can promise you, when you're getting into your 60s and your 70s, as a gentleman that is worth over a hundred million dollars, money isn't that big of a deal. At a certain point, you start thinking about your legacy and how is history going to remember me? And I can guarantee you, Jerome Powell has two images in his mind right now. One, Arthur Burns, and two, Paul Volcker. So let me ask all the gentlemen watching this video right now, would you rather be remembered as the guy on the right or the guy on the left? <laughs> and I say that jokingly, but it's true. In fact, whenever I see that picture on the left, what's funny is I always envision AOC asking Paul Volcker, that Paul Volcker smoking the cigar, what is he gonna do specifically to help the economic conditions for the trans community. Just picture that just for a moment. <laughs> what do you think Paul Volcker's response would be? But back to this video, I think it's safe to say that if he could choose, Jerome Powell would want to be remembered as someone like Paul Volcker, someone that had the intestinal fortitude to do what is right. Okay, let's check out this chart goes all the way back to 1966 to 2020. This is a chart of the R star interest rate. And I'll go into why this is so important in just a moment. But on the left, we go from 0% up to 6%. So 19, 
call it 64, 65. It's up at 6%, and then it goes down, pretty much trends all the way down to where we are today or where we were in 2020 because they stopped publishing this at, let's say, 0.5% or 50 basis points. So going back to what this is, this is one of the key models that the Fed uses to try to determine what real rates should be. Specifically, I believe it's the one-year treasury, but obviously that's very correlated to the overnight Fed funds rate. And I say what it quote unquote should be. So in their minds, they're trying to determine at what rate of real interest is the economy at a perfect level to where you're maximizing unemployment, you're keeping the unemployment rate as low as possible, while at the same time, you're creating a monetary condition or environment for the CPI inflation to be relatively low, let's say 2% or 3%. So going back to 1980-81, and this is key, this is when Volcker took rates up high enough to smash inflation or to break the back of inflation, our star was around 4%. And if you remember, Paul Volcker took the Fed funds rate up to about 18%. So let's just say, back of the napkin math here, the CPI was running at 14%. Our star was 4%. And this is most likely why Paul Volcker took rates up to 18%. Again, remember this R star is what the real rate of interest should be, meaning the rate of interest above and beyond consumer price inflation. So now that we understand that this is one of the main models the Fed uses, let's think about it in terms of what we're dealing with today. So the CPI is 8.6%. So if the PhDs at the Fed, including Jerome Powell, and if Jerome Powell wants his legacy to be Paul Volcker instead of Arthur Burns, in his mind, he's thinking that the Fed funds rate needs to be at 9.1%, or at least the one-year treasury would have to be at 9.1%, which would mean Fed funds would have to be very close to that rate of interest. Now, I'm not saying that Jerome Powell is going to take it that high. But I am saying that most likely he's going to try to take it a lot higher. He's going to try to take it to a point where potentially it could crush asset prices inadvertently and crush the economy to the point where we could see deflation. To take it to the next step, let's go to the internet and see how even in the Fed's own words, they admit this R star tool, if you will, is a very blunt instrument that can have massive unintended consequences. This is from the Dallas Fed's own website when they're discussing the R star rate or the neutral rate as it's sometimes called. Despite the fact that judging the level of the neutral rate is inherently uncertain and imprecise, many of us at the Federal Reserve pay close attention to the various models that seek to estimate this rate. The reason is that despite the relatively wide confidence bands around these estimates, they can provide an indication, albeit what? Imperfect, <laughs> of whether our monetary stance is accommodative, neutral, or restrictive. So they're admitting to you that this key tool is imprecise and uncertain. Their words, not mine. So is it a stretch to believe that Jerome Powell will take rates up to a point where he breaks something? I think everybody agrees on that. But the level where he breaks something is far too high. They overshoot the goal, which takes us back to the process we outlined in step number one and step number two. Let me be very, very clear. I am not saying that we will see deflation in the United States. This is not a prediction. My base case is that we see some disinflation, meaning the level of inflation going down slightly in Q3, maybe Q4, and then they come back in with monetary policy and fiscal, and we see another wave 
of inflation, meaning the CPI going higher and higher. But I think there is a strong possibility, a possibility that is far above a 0% probability <laughs> that we do see deflation and something very similar to what we saw in the 1940s, where again, in 47, inflation was 19.5%, and two or three years later, it was 3% deflation. I think every single one of you watching this video right now would say that the Fed is prone to making errors. Maybe you would go so far to say that they're all idiots, they're all morons. Okay, fine. <laughs> well, if they're morons and idiots that can cause inflation, maybe, just maybe, they're idiots and morons that can inadvertently cause deflation as well. For more content that'll help you build wealth and thrive in a world of out-of-control central banks and big governments, check out this playlist right here, and I will see you on the next video.